check this yes. Every Monday morning in Tumor Board, doctors who treat cancer get together at Baylor Clinic to discuss difficult cases. For one particular case, a doctor said, we can't cure it if it doesn't fit in a box. He was referring to the use of focused radiation therapy in which high energy x-rays are directed at a cancer. The problem is, if the cancer doesn't fit in a box, a box that you can cut out with a surgical scalpel, or a box that you can destroy with radiation. If the cancer spread outside of the box, to other parts of the body, or if it's too close to important structures like the heart or the brainstem, what do you do? The goal is to cure everyone's cancer, not just those with cancer small enough to cut or to destroy with radiation. In this talk, I want to show you how to think of cancer in a box differently. Not as a box for radiation or surgery. That's too limiting. Instead, I want you to think of cancer in a box as cancer in a computer. By putting cancer in a computer, I want to use the same computing power in your smartphone to treat cancer. We do this by taking cancers, putting them in a sophisticated meat grinder, and analyzing the data that comes out. We call this DNA sequencing. I'll show you that 50% of all progress in cancer medicine over the last 10 years is a result of sequencing, that is, digitizing cancers. After the Human Genome Project was completed in 2000, the cost of DNA sequencing dropped as quickly as Moore's Law, which is responsible for bringing you better and faster smartphones every two years. In 2007, with the technical breakthrough called Next Generation Sequencing, the cost of DNA sequencing dropped even faster than Moore's Law. Coincidentally, 2007 is also the year that we started seeing this slide in the investor pitch decks of every Silicon Valley biotech startup. Cancer researchers were quick to take advantage of this breakthrough. By sequencing a patient's cancer and a patient's normal tissue, you get two DNA sequences, or two books of about three billion letters each. And by comparing these two books, we can pull out mutations specific to a patient's cancer. In 2008, cancer patients, scientists did exactly this for a patient with leukemia. And they sequenced the world's first cancer genome. By 2013, over 3,000 cancer genomes had been sequenced through the Cancer Genome Atlas. By 2017, the Cancer Genome Atlas, or TCGA, was wrapping up. At that time, 11,000 patients had had their cancers sequenced, representing 33 cancer types. All in all, 500,000 DVDs had been produced. It's at least a few hours of Netflix content. <laughs> the question is, what do we do with all this data and the technological and computing pipelines for generating more of this data? We are talking about cancer, so the answer is that we use this data to save lives. When I first started medical school, this article, A Genetic Gamble, came out in the New York Times. It described the story of Lucas Wartman, who was a medical student just like me. He wanted to be a hematologist oncologist, or a doctor who treats cancers to the blood. He himself was diagnosed with leukemia at age 25. Initially, he received chemotherapy, and his leukemia went away. But then it came back, and after that, his chances of surviving leukemia were under 5%. So his doctors took an experimental approach. They put his cancer in a box. They put a needle in his bone marrow, took out some of his leukemia, put it into a meat grinder that at Washington University we call the Genome Institute, and analyzed the data that came out. What they found was very similar to this, in which every color represents a different strain or clone of leukemia with a different set of mutations. Unlike traditional tests, sequencing captured the full complexity of leukemia, a disease that isn't static but evolves with time, and isn't uniform but is composed of many layers or clones. And what sequencing found was that these leukemia clones shared an overactive gene. This overactive gene could be treated with a kidney cancer drug. Lucas started receiving this kidney cancer drug, which he never would have received without DNA sequencing, and his leukemia went away. He's now a professor at the medical school I attended, and his ability to defy the odds and rid his body of leukemia was a direct result of sequencing. So by putting cancer in a box, by putting cancer in a computer, we can search for better therapies to give our patients. In the last few years, 
Sequencing has become so fundamental to cancer research and cancer medicine, the top hospitals like MD Anderson and deep pocket institutions that you normally don't associate with medicine, like the federal government and Google, have been pouring billions of dollars into sequencing everyone's cancers. Now that we can sequence cancers and identify cancer mutations, we're having to invent new types of clinical trials. Instead of a clinical trial for patients with lung cancer, we can run a trial for patients with lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer. It doesn't really matter what kind of cancer they have. As long as their cancer has a specific mutation, they can receive a trial drug using this new type of trial design, a basket trial. So how has this new drug development strategy panned out? Increasingly, we see results like this, in which all the vertical bars beneath the horizontal line represent a cancer that shrink in response to an experimental drug. All the different colors represent different types of cancer, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer. And you can see that it doesn't really matter where the cancer originated in the body. As long as it has a specific mutation, there's a good chance this experimental drug will work for that patient. This graph in particular represents cancers with microsatellite instability, a class of mutations that renders the cancer susceptible to immunotherapy. In 2017, the FDA approved immunotherapy for solid tumors with microsatellite instability, the first example of a drug approval for a cancer's mutation, not for where it originated in the body. At the end of medical school, I had a classmate who wasn't feeling very well. He had a lot of reasons for not feeling very well. He was on a surgery rotation, so that's what we chalked it up to, until he went to the doctor's office, and they found that he had a rare type of pancreatic cancer, the same type of pancreatic cancer that Steve Jobs passed away from. When they sequenced his tumor, they found that his cancer had microsatellite instability, and he received this immunotherapy. If his Facebook photos from his recent wedding are to be believed, he's doing quite well. Again, the ability to defy the odds through sequencing to identify the best therapy for our patients. One final example of putting cancer in a box starts, as many stories start, with someone getting pregnant. For a pregnant mom, she can look for how her baby is doing by getting a blood test. When she gets a blood test, part of the DNA in her blood comes from her, and part of the DNA comes from baby. This is actually very common, non-invasive prenatal testing. I wouldn't know that it's very common because I've never been pregnant. But, um, hundreds of thousands of women get these blood tests every year, and very rarely, these tests identify cancer in a pregnant woman. Like babies, when we have a cancer, part of the DNA in our blood comes from us, and part of the DNA comes from the cancer. We can look for these little pieces of DNA, not just in pregnant women, but in everyone. Again, we take blood from a patient, put it into a sophisticated juicer, and analyze the data that comes out. And by doing so, we can find cancers early, monitor cancers in a non-invasive way, and identify the best therapies for our cancer patients. At the end of the day, I agree with the doctor who said, you can't cure it if it doesn't fit in a box. But that shouldn't limit us as doctors or as patients. If the cancer doesn't fit in a traditional box, a box in which you can only cure cancer if it's small, if it's early stage, then we can put cancers in a different type of box. By creating boxes, by combining computing power with methods for probing and manipulating the rich biology within cancers, we can create new tools to control this devastating disease. Thank you.